Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are very glad to invite Yosef Marzo. He's an associate professor of aeronautics and astronautics uh, in MIT. Uh, he's also a director of Aerospace Computational Laboratory. So he's here because uh, we share kind of very similar interests when it comes to inverse problems, uh, uncertainty quantification, and geophysics. Uh, so uh, he's willing to talk to us uh, after the talk. We have two more slots uh, at 2.15 and at 1.30. The one at 1.30 is already booked. So we have one more slot from 2.15 to 3 o'clock. If someone wants to talk to him uh, after his talk, uh, Please come to the front desk and we can book an appointment uh, on Monday. <laughs> on Monday. <laughs> this is the front desk. We'll check you in. Yeah, we'll check you in on Monday and Tuesday mornings. You're going to do it. All right, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, thank you, everyone, for, for the invitation. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, I'll emphasize that um, since I'm local, um, I'm easy to meet with. Um, so if you want to chat, just uh, we'll talk to Paul or ping me and we can, we can chat next week. Um, if it doesn't work this afternoon. So um, I want to talk about uh, work we've been doing, kind of this kind of a broad uh, maybe overview of uh, some work we've been doing that tries to address computational challenges in Bayesian <coughs> Um So if you're taking the Bayesian approach to inverse problems, uh, this has you know, certainly some, some nice features, but also a lot of kind of intrinsic computational uh, bottlenecks. And a lot of work that we've done for the past many years is trying to address those bottlenecks. And this is joint work with a bunch of people, um, actually with Andy Davis, who's in the audience here, um, uh, my current uh, postdocs, Daniele Bigoni and Alessio Spantini, former PhD student Patrick Conrad, um, Nitesh Pillai at Harvard, and Aaron Smith at Ottawa, and uh, probably various other people figure in the industry. So, broadly speaking, what is the Bayesian approach to inverse problems about? So, this is actually a picture of a geothermal reservoir in New Zealand. Uh, that my former postdoc, uh, Tang Yang Tsui, uh, actually did his thesis on. And the idea here is that uh, you can make indirect observations of this reservoir, and you want to learn uh, the parameters and state uh, of the system. So here you can actually sort of look at temperature. In this particular example, they were able to measure temperature and pressure in boreholes. And then they wanted to learn things like the temperature throughout the reservoir and the saturation, things like that. So in that sense, what we're trying to do is relate observations, which I'm denoting why, to some parameters, uh, and the parameters are indirectly related to the observations. And the observations are going to, in this case, be kind of limited in number, costly, endowed with noise. So there's going to be uncertainty in the parameters, and we want to characterize that uncertainty uh, in the Bayesian way. So the Bayesian setting here, just uh, this x should be a theta. I just want to use theta to, to refer to the parameters. And the Bayesian setting, in sort of its simplest form, writing it down Bayes' rule, what we're interested in characterizing is the posterior distribution of the parameters theta, which I'm representing here with its density, conditioned on the observations y. And according to the Bayes' rule, this is a product of two things on the right-hand side. There's a likelihood function, probability density of y given theta, but viewed as a function of the parameters theta. And then the prior distribution, which also one could say a lot about. But in general, so you can write down this distribution uh, up to a constant of proportionality, and you'd like to characterize it in some way. Now, how you construct this model and what goes into this model is many, many, many talks in and of itself, so I don't want to actually spend you know, too much time digging into that. I'm going to sort of focus on the computational challenge, but I'll just comment that this likelihood function is typically where um, a model for the observations might enter, so a forward model. So for instance, if I have some PDE model that relates you know, the, 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 I don't know, the permeability of cross or some depth, some transport properties to things that I can actually observe, like pressure or saturation, um, that PDE model will be embedded in the likelihood because that's part of my model for how the observations arise given a particular value of the parameters. Right? So this likelihood is a statistical model for the depth of observations, but embedded within it might be some deterministic expensive forward model. And then the prior one could say a whole lot about how choose the prior, but I'll assume that one is done. Uh, the computational challenge is really, we could maybe divide into a couple issues. The parameters might be high dimensional. For instance, they might represent a discretization of this, of the, of this function here, this is a function say of space, so then I could have an arbitrarily large number of parameters in the context. This posterior distribution is in, might in general be non-Gaussian. If it's Gaussian, there are easier things to do than what I'm going to talk about here. And also, each evaluation of this posterior density is going to cost you something. Naively, it's going to cost you one PDE solve. It's going to cost you one evaluation of the likelihood. And if you have to do that a thousand or a million times, you might not like that so much. So this is kind of you know one of those computational models. 
And we're kind of in the standard setting for Bayesian computation, where as I said, you can evaluate the density of the parameters that you care about up to a normalizing constant. Normalizing constant that you do not know. So what do you want to do with this? Um, in general, well, I mean, you can write down the, the, the posterior, but that's really not even the whole start of the challenge. I mean, writing it down is just, just a fraction of things. What you really want to do is extract information from it. So I want to look at means, covariances of the parameters theta. Maybe I want to look at the probability of a particular event, say theta being larger than some threshold or some function of theta, and I want to look at its probability of, of being in a particular set. Um, I might want to take that uncertainty in theta and propagate it forward to something else. In general, I can write all of these things as expectations over the posterior. So, so for some function h, I want to take its expectation with respect to the posterior. Now, to make this computationally tractable, I think there are at least kind of two complementary paths that one has to think about. And I'm going to talk about this is kind of actually the two main things I'm going to talk about in this talk. One is, well, if the forward model is so expensive, or if the likelihood is so expensive, how can we approximate it in a principle? And there's a zoo of approaches one can consider. What are sort of useful things to do? What can you say about this approximation? Um, and the second is, OK, maybe even if the forward model is not terribly expensive, simply actually evaluating this integral. So for instance, if I wanted to evaluate this integral by drawing samples from high posterior, how do I go about doing that? And what are efficient ways of going about doing that? And I think both of these are kind of, you know, solving the first one doesn't really solve the second one, and vice versa. I think both of them kind of have to be addressed in general, kind of complicated stage. So this is actually really not one to talk. I want to talk a little bit about you know some current work we're doing both for problem one and for problem two. So just to kind of maybe go one level of detail deeper in terms of in very simple Bayesian settings. Um, so just to kind of reset notation, I have some parameters theta. I have a prior density here I'm going to note by f. I have a forward model that relates my parameters to uh, basically it takes the parameters and relates them to the observations. Um, but it's not the entirety of the likelihood. The likelihood essentially might take the forward model prediction f and compare that with the data in some way. So embedded in the construction of the likelihood is some assumption about the error or the discrepancy or the noise or the difference in general between the forward model prediction and, uh, and what you can actually observe. A very simple one would be that say y is f of theta plus some Gaussian. So that's a very simplistic assumption. Um, in general, one could do a lot more sophisticated things, but in general, this is sort of built into the likelihood. And every single time I want to evaluate the likelihood, I need to, in principle, evaluate this forward model. Okay. So this kind of thing. Now, just to kind of maybe be slightly more comprehensive, I'm setting aside all kinds of things like hierarchical Bayesian modeling. I'm setting aside things like maybe I don't know the noise that appears in the likelihood. Maybe I don't know parameters in the prior. One could construct far more elaborate Bayesian models than this. So I don't want to give you the impression that this is the entirety of what needs, one needs to do for Bayesian modeling and these problems. Many, many more elaborate things can be done. But let's just focus on this very simple case and kind of address the computational challenges there. So, okay, forward model approximation. So, you know, a very simple approach is to say, what's the most expensive thing in my problem? And let's, let's approximate it. So if the forward model is the most expensive thing, for instance, if I know the forward model, if, if then evaluating the likelihood is cheap, then let me construct approximations of the forward model. And a simple approach, one that you know, sort of, um, has been around for a little while, is to say, well, let's construct an approximation of the forward model f that is accurate in some sense over the prior distribution. So if I believe my prior distribution says what are possible parameter values that I'm likely to encounter, let me construct an approximation that is good over the support of the prior. Good in what sense? For instance, in a prior way that L2 sets. And one thing that you can show, this is an early result, is that if this approximation converges, say, in the prior way that L2 sets, to the true forward model, then the posterior that is induced by that approximation, so in other words, if I take that approximation and plug it into likelihood and thus construct an approximate likelihood, and I look at the resulting posterior, that posterior converges to the real posterior at actually the same rate. And so it's sort of initial results here. Suppose I have a bunch of forward model approximations at n uh, that converge at some rate. For instance, one of these are polynomial approximations and m is a polynomial degree. Then I can have a corresponding approximate posterior pi m and these converge to the true posterior in the sense of KL divergence um, at the same rate for sufficiently large number. So this is basically saying, if you can do a good job um, approximating the forward model in some sense with the prior, so this is actually the same thing you would do if you're interested, in, for instance, in uncertainty propagation uh, using polynomial approximations, then if you can solve the uncertainty propagation problem propagating the prior uncertainty through the model, then you can actually solve the inference problem um, in a good way. 
So this is a pretty simple result, and there's some more general results um, from Stewart and Company. So you preserve the convergence rate. But it doesn't mean it's a good approximation. Absolutely not. I have no idea what the constant is here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what I'm getting to. Yeah. No idea. I mean, it's I know... It's comforting. It's, it's comforting. I mean, yeah. 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 You would, one would like at least this. If this were not true, yeah. I wouldn't be comforted. Um, okay. But, so, this is a great segue. There are obviously kind of, you know, even though you can preserve the conversion rate, there are more efficient things you can do. There are things that affect your amount of computational effort you have to expend. So one thought is that focusing the approximation or the surrogate, I'll use that kind of engineering terminology, um, on the posterior distribution itself can improve efficiency. So to kind of give you a cartoon to maybe explain why that is, suppose I have some Gaussian prior whose contours are represented by these blue circles, but suppose the posterior, once actually conditioned on the data, is typically quite concentrated with respect to the prior. So suppose the posterior contours are these green uh, contours here. In that sense, constructing an approximation that's very accurate in these regions of the prior, that I know, if I'm going to say sample the posterior, I'm never going to visit, seems a bit wasteful. <coughs> now, of course, there's a bit of chicken in the egg, because how do I know where the posterior is until I construct the approximation and so on and so forth. Um, but there has been work on basically trying to construct posterior-focused approximations, and they generally involve some kind of iteration, some kind of like, <coughs> first approximation, explore that sort of approximate posterior, Iterate, improve the approximation in the sort of regions, and you can sort of do these things. Now, one thing you can say is about all the techniques that I kind of mentioned here is that they involve constructing an approximation and then at some point stopping. And once you're stopping, fixing the approximation, freezing it. Once you've done that, you can then draw samples from that approximation in the posterior. And but those are samples from an approximate posterior. And you would like to know how close are those samples to samples from the true posterior. And in general, there might be unknown constants that you really can't really control. And the other thing is that you're sort of bearing the approximation cost of your pre work. So you're sort of doing all this offline work, effectively before you solve the inference problem to construct the approximation. And then you're going to go out and do some sampling of the posterior, and that incurs its own error because you take a finite number of samples. How do you balance all these errors together? Especially when, when, when you're in general difficult to compound. So, Another sort of approach um, that people have proposed is to say, well, okay, forget about these approximations. Uh, I don't want to solve a sample from the approximation and sort of call that end of story. I want to sample from the exact posterior, but maybe use the approximations to help me along the way. And um, the first such scheme that I think is, is quite general is this notion of delayed acceptance, MCMC. So this is from Kristen Colin Fox. And the idea here is that you have some approximate model, and you essentially use that to kind of screen samples that you draw during MCMC. So I have some approximate model. If according to my approximate model, this is a good sample, I'll accept it. And then I'm going to go check that sample against the full model. And when it sort of checks out against the full sample in the proper sense, then I'll finally accept it. So this will guarantee that you sample from the posterior that is induced by the full model. But it's going to cost you at least one model evaluation per accepted sample. So this is sort of nice and that you don't need to worry about accuracy, although accuracy of your approximation does affect efficiency. Um, but it's sort of not, it's maybe underusing the approximation. If your approximation is very good, then maybe you don't need to keep checking the full model on that approximation. So um, a different approach that we've been pursuing is to say, okay, let's somehow, can we do something that preserves the asymptotic exactness of MCMC, in the sense that if I sample enough, I'm going to get um, samples from the true distribution, but maybe incrementally, infinitely refine the approximation as I go. So the idea here is sort of, you know, keeping with the philosophy of the previous slide, can we explore the posterior and construct the approximation simultaneously, and somehow tie the convergence of the surrogate to the convergence of the MCMC shape itself? And this idea is kind of discussed in the, in the two papers um, that I described here. So let me describe this idea by kind of jumping back to Vanilla MCMC. So if, um, if you're not familiar with MCMC, um, MCMC Marco Chain Monte Carlo, um, this is kind of a workhorse algorithm for Bayesian computation. And this is um, an algorithm that dates back to the 50s. And it is enormously flexible because it essentially says that it lets you draw samples from an arbitrary target distribution whose density I know up to a normalizing constant. And it's a very powerful algorithm, but within this algorithm there's it can sometimes work very well, and it can sometimes work terribly, and there's a whole lot of room for design and adjustment of that. But the basic algorithm is like this. 
So essentially, you want to construct a markup chain that samples from the target distribution. So I have, I've written down my, my Bayesian model, I have my forward model, I have the likelihood, I have I've written down the posterior, and now I want to draw samples from that posterior. But I only know this, the density of the posterior up to a normalizing constant. So MCMC says, let me construct a chain that's going to walk around in support of the posterior and eventually draw samples that look like they're coming from the posterior. So it's going to sort of spend a lot of time in the region's high probability, less time in the region's low probability, and do the right thing. So the idea is as follows. I basically, you can, this is a recipe for the transition kernel. Given a current state of that Markov chain, you propose a new state from some kernel Q. And then you would compute this acceptance ratio that says, should I accept that new state or not? And here you'll notice there's a likelihood, there's the prior, and embedded in the likelihood is the forward model. This is saying, does the new state improve my likelihood of times the prior? Does it improve my posterior density or not? If it does, I'll accept it. If not, I might still accept it with some probability. And so on and so forth. Now, this is going to require evaluate, if I run this for n steps, I'm going to evaluate the forward model n times. And that's typically what costs me. The, the typical with dominance over time. Now, here's a modified version of the algorithm um, with kind of a similar idea. It says, let me replace the forward model that's sitting here in the likelihood with an approximation. So I've taken the f here and I've replaced it with some f tilde. And this approximation is indexed by the current state of the chain. So it's indexed by t. And I'm going to make this approximation in principle better and better as the chain goes along. And um, how exactly do I do it? So, so I'm going to decide whether to accept a sample only using the approximation, but then, um, as needed, and as needed hides some interesting conditions, I will decide to run the true model, either near the current state of the chain or near the proposed state of the chain, with some probability according to some criteria that I'll describe, and take that new full model evaluation and use that to build a better approximation of till um, next time around. So replacing this up till t with up till t plus one. And the idea is that the approximations that I'm going to build, the approximations of the forward model, are approximations that are built on some sample set S, and the sample set S was being enlarged whenever I run the forward model again. And the sample set S simply consists of parameter values and evaluations of the forward model at those, at those parameter values. And this is, so this is effectively I'm building up a set of samples on which I evaluate the forward model, from those samples, I'm going to construct this approximation in a way I have it to describe. And I'm going to enlarge that sample set every once in a while according to some criteria that I have it to describe. But this is the, the rough idea. And the idea is that I'm going to do this forever. As t goes to infinity, the sample set will continue growing. The approximation should get better. And that's the way we can do it. So what kind of approximation do we use? Um, in this context, the approximations that we use are local approximations. So these are, if you think of local regression or local interpolation. The idea is that basically you construct an approximation if I'm sitting at some point in the parameter space. I look around, I construct a ball around myself of radius r, and I find all the model evaluations that are within that ball, and actually choose that ball radius so that it includes a certain number of model evaluations. And then I construct a simple approximation, for instance, quadratic regression, or lower the polynomial regression. This is like, this is kind of a non this is a non-parameter regression, which is actually local, local polynomial. So I use the samples within some distance, and then weigh the samples, and I construct some local polynomial approximation. And these approximations converge under pretty loose conditions. And the sense in which they converge is that basically, as the balls get smaller, the approximation gets better. Now, where R here is the radius of the ball, there's some constants that we're talking about. So now, a cartoon of the algorithm you could imagine now is a bit like this. So early on, so the, the green is my posterior. Uh, the red circles are balls where I might want to construct the approximation, and the blue dots represent points in my sample set. So places where I've run that expensive model, where I've collected them in that sample set. So these are the points where I've run the model, and suppose I want to evaluate the model here. I'm constructing the balls so that it includes, say, three samples, and I construct my, my approximation, and I evaluate that approximation at the center of the ball. Will that be a good approximation? No. Maybe not so great to, at this early stage. But as time goes on and I run more and more model evaluations, the ball that I would construct in a similar region of the parameter space is now much smaller in radius, and that approximation is better. And basically, as the algorithm runs, the blue dots get denser, the red circles get smaller, and the approximation gets better and better. Now, how do I decide when to run the model? Um, the key thing from the theoretical 
perspective is actually just to do so random, so it's going to be dumb. It's not very adaptive, but just to say, with some probability, I'm going to run the model, I'm going to run the model and add a new point to my sample set. And the probabilities have to diverge. In other words, in an infinite number of steps, I need to run the model an infinite number of times. So this sequence has to converge, say, like, as one over two. So you can evaluate the model with diminishing probability as time goes on, but it can't diminish too quickly. So this is kind of a non-adaptive thing. But then you can imagine there are better things to do. And one thing that we have done uh, is basically to say, well, you know, can we also come up with some kind of error indicator that says if our approximation is good or not in this region? We use something simple, which is cross-validation on the acceptance probability. Because acceptance probability is, after all, what affects the MCMC most directly. And then you can decide to refine if you see some error threshold. And there may be better things to do than this. Andy's actually working on some improvements to this kind of um, error indicator. Okay. And then the kind of final question to kind of fill out the algorithm is, okay, so if I decide I am going to refine, whether by the random criterion or by the error indicator, where should I evaluate the model? So if this screen is my 2D parameter space and I decide I need to con construct a new model evaluation uh, for a ball centered at this plus, where should I do it? Well, in some sense, I want to do it in a way that makes a nice geometry. Sort of gives you a nice geometry for approximation. Um, in the context of local approximation, this is this notion of poisonness that captures the, 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 the sort of quality of the geometry of the points. And what we want to do is essentially add points in a kind of a locally space-filling way that controls poisonous. So one way would be to solve this optimization problem here, and there's kind of nicer methods that take advantage of polynomial approximation and put points in places that um, could be a bit poisonous. So locally, you're doing some kind of experimental design, but overall, the points that you choose to run the model at are unstructured because these balls, the places where you're asking for a model for approximations, are determined by the MCMC. So essentially, the MCMC chain is visiting a region that determines where the ball center is, in that local region, you decide you're going to improve the model, and then you improve the model by picking this point. So let's see if I understand. Yeah. So I, you know, after a while, you'll have different balls with more approximations. So is there any big overhead on number one when you propose a new sample, figuring out which ball it's in, mm -hmm. and number two, storing much of the approximation is a Jacobian on the left. Yeah. I mean, do you have to store? Terabytes yeah. worth of Jacobian information because there's so many applications. It's a great question. So yeah. the balls are constructed on the fly and then forgotten. Mm -hmm. So basically, if, I, if I'm at a point in the current space, I construct at that instant a new ball. Basically, by looking around, <coughs> I'm sitting here, I just say, let me look around, let me construct a ball around myself that includes a certain number of model evaluations. And let me construct the approximation in that ball and then use that approximation and forget about it. Um, the thing that I have to keep are the model evaluations. So if I now step somewhere over here and construct a new ball, I'm going to look around and see, okay, where are the model evaluations in my new ball? I'll use, I'll go back to that sample set and use those to construct new population. So you have to do a nearest neighbor search. You have to search for like your k nearest neighbors at every single step of the algorithm, um, and you have to keep all the model evaluations. So basically, you need to keep the values of theta and then the values of the forward model output at every single yeah. step. Which is not too bad. So you're not keeping, and, and you don't keep track of the balls explicitly. But you just keep the keep track of the sample set. Um, so could the ball be a unit, or can only be a circle? <laughs> um, no, that's a good, so so far we've been very naive. We've just done a circle. Um, you could you could imagine making the ellipse. That's kind of like rescaling the parameter space. Mm -hmm. in so one okay, one interesting question is okay, if I know something about if I have some kind of Hessian approximation, something that would make a curvature this year, can I use that to construct better balls? Um, absolutely. We haven't done that. But that's absolutely something. Those are some directions more benign than others. Can it be scaled? Other questions? Yeah? Um, so the ball is basically the key between the Well, L0 would be weird. Um, no. <laughs> yeah. L, L1. Um, you know, I think, uh, so, so the reason we're using an L2, so you could use a weighted L2, kind of like a term, so you could use sort of like, and thus construct a little thing. Um, people have done L infinity. Uh, so we kind of borrowed, this idea is used a lot in derivative free optimization, uh, algorithms like Kobila, that, where, and typically the choices there are L infinity, so squares, um, or L2 circles. Um, and both, for both, you can kind of write something 
Um, you can kind of write something like this. So here I haven't been. So however you define this ball. So you can have some kind of convergence as the ball goes. Um, I think two and infinity are the common choices. Um, I'm not sure of any particular advantage to going less than two. So, as I understand it, if you were going to do an online Bayesian uh, uh, inversion, mm -hmm. um, you'd have to carry the complete model with you and the accumulating data over time. Oh, online in that sense, where the data are arriving. Real, real time. Yeah. yeah. As opposed to, say, constructing a reduced order model and just using it online and constructing from the complete model. I realize this is a lot more accurate if you can do it, but it would seem yeah. to be a computational limit in a real-time setting. Yeah. So here, so yeah, I'll first say that we definitely do not have in mind for this yet online problem. So, so here we assume the data are all collected in batch. The posterior is defined, and our goal is just to explore it. Um, now, if the data start to arrive sequentially, um, you're right. I mean, the questions of how you approximate the model on the fly and so forth uh, become more complicated because now you sort of have two things happening. Like, you might say for a fixed, say, data horizon, I want to make the model more accurate. And that's the asymptotic sense in which this thing is working. But now there's, as I get more data, you know, so in some sense, when I get more data, update my uh, posterior, but, and do I want to make the, that model more accurate kind of simultaneously? So, I mean, that'll be an interesting question because now your posterior is concentrated. If, it's, if you're, say, you're doing parameter estimation, that's what you're doing parameter estimation. The posterior is concentrating at some rate as you get more and more data. Um, you can make the model more and more accurate in that smaller and smaller region. Um, that would be interesting. In some sense, I think those approaches might play nicely with each other because you're asking for more and more accuracy in a smaller and smaller region. Um, so we haven't tried that one. So if you do all this, um, then you have you know, some sort of method fill filling points. And what you can actually show is that this sampler is ergodic. So basically, if I construct this chain where at every single step, the MCMC pro acceptance probability is being evaluated with an approximate model, if the approximate model is getting better at the appropriate rate, then the law, the probability law of the state of the chain, converges to the true target as the chain goes to infinity. So this is kind of the very basic convergence result for MCMC. Um, but this is kind of the same convergence guarantee that you get with a generic MCMC algorithm, except this MCMC algorithm has an approximation built into it. And saying something about rates is much, much harder in, in general. But, uh, but you can say that about many instances. Well. So within this now, on a practical level, you can build in, this is, you can think of this now as a framework for using local approximations um, on the fly in MCMC, and many kinds of local approximations, and many targets of approximations. So should I approximate the forward model? That's kind of what I've talked about. You could also imagine approximating the log likelihood. Um, this is a scalar, whereas the forward model might be vector value, so might save some storage. Um, should I construct uh, approximation that's like lower order polynomial regression? Should I use Gaussian processes? Um, if I had gradients of that, should I use those to, to do my regression more effectively with fewer points? And then what kind of MCMC should I use? This? Should I use you know, what MCMC kernel? What's my favorite proposal? Adaptive metropolis? Should I use something fancier like HMC? Um, this is sort of particularly interesting because maybe I actually don't have access to the derivatives of the forward model. Maybe it's a black box. But my approximation is some polynomial. I can certainly take derivatives of that and then construct proposals that require derivatives. So in this sense, there's a lot of things that one can do. And then there's also, you can start to do something with parallel chains, which I'll describe in a second. So just to kind of give you a quick example, this is kind of a, you know, the baby problem that we all test things on. So this is both to PDE. We're trying to learn the coefficient. The coefficient parameterized in some way using the KL expansion from prior. And here I'm showing you, as a function of the number of MCMC steps, the costs of different chains. And the red is basically the vanilla algorithm. So if I take 10 to the fourth steps, I've run the forward model 10 to the fourth times, and if I take 10 to the fifth steps, 10 to the fifth times, and you know, what you see is what we get. Now with different levels of local approximation, local linear, quadratic, or local Gaussian process, you actually find that you're evaluating the forward model far fewer times in a given number of MCMC steps. So here in 10 to the fifth steps, we're evaluating the forward model a couple hundred times. But what about the accuracy? So if I now show basically 
Um, the total number of model valuations on the horizontal axis, so this is cost, this is how you get cost. And accuracy, so how do you estimate accuracy? Here I'm just taking the covariance of the posterior um, the matrix, and I'm comparing it to the true covariance, which I get from exhaustive sampling, and look at some notion of relative error. Um, for this one. So you can see actually all the chains basically give you about the same error, but the full model gives you the same thing at much higher cost versus linear, uh, quadratic, and then answer processor. So you can get roughly the same relative error um, with a couple order of magnitudes less cost. Now, why is this you know, notion? Effectively, what we're doing is taking advantage of some regularity or some smoothness in the forward model output. This is something that MCMC blind, generic MCMC is blind to. But by taking advantage of the regularity, in fact, these approximations can converge quickly. You don't need to evaluate the forward model nearly as much. Um, other things you could do, so this is a more um, complicated problem, so here we have this under PD for hydraulic head, which would then enter the tracer transport equation, and what we're going to do is observe tracer, and then we're going to tracer concentrations at several times with some error, and then try to infer um, the law of conductivity field that's parameterized on these patches. Um, this is a slightly more challenging model. For us, this forward model takes about 13 seconds to evaluate serially, so. I mean, you might laugh at that and say that's not terribly expensive, but if you intended to do that 100,000 or a million times, that would be quite expensive. Um, so this is just kind of pictures of the solution field at a specific um, slice in time. Um, this is the hydraulic head, and the arrows are the R of the Darcy velocity, and this is the tracer concentration. But you can imagine the Ford model essentially constructs a movie of these fields, and you observe it with some time snapshots. Um, so we parameterized um, the conductivity field on this patchwork. This is a picture of the posterior distribution. So on the diagonal, I have the law conductivities at certain points in space. They're marginal distributions, and these are pairwise marginal distributions, so the joint distributions of two parameters at a time in this kind of lower triangle plot. So the point is, this is a non-Gaussian posterior. It looks kind of interesting. There's correlation with some structure. And now we're going to try to explore this posterior using the local approximation, but we're also going to try to do this in parallel. So this is kind of the, the additional ingredient. Um, the idea is that if I have all these chains, if I have multiple chains running in parallel, um, how do I take advantage of that? Now, there are many ways of making parallel chains mix better, let's say taking the state of one chain and importing it to another chain and having them swap information back and forth. And those are all nice, but what I'm going to propose here is complementary to that. What the chains are going to do now is share all their model evaluations. So if one chain sort of decided to refine its approximation at some region in parameter space and add to the set curly S, it's going to then make that expensive model evaluation available to other chains. And they'll all share their model evaluations asynchronously. So as they get more and more chains, they should be able to exchange these model evaluations. And each chain should then individually, hopefully, be able to evaluate the forward model less frequently, smaller and more. So the experiment here is we're running k chains, where k is going to change, of 10 to the fifth steps each. Uh, we discard maybe the initial part of the chain's burn-in, we look at the effective sample size, and I'll emphasize here the effective sample size, which is kind of the quality of the chain, and we're effectively in the samples for the chain. If I divided it, uh, so if I did ESS per hour, that's kind of a measure of computational efficiency, but if I do ESS per hour per chain, then that effectively means that there's no information sharing, there's no particular advantage to sharing chains, to having multiple chains other than just having more samples. So that would be, that's kind of the baseline that would be the implementation. So what we're showing here is error, uh, this is error in the vertical axis versus runtime, and the gray is um, no approximation, so kind of the full model, and the um, colored lines are with the approximation, and as they go from kind of pink to brown or purple, we're increasing the number of parallel chains from one to three. So on the one hand you say, and, and so we're doing the same thing here, we're going from um, one to 30 parallel chains. Now, the error is smaller as you get more parallel chains, just because you've pooled more samples. You have more samples with which you're estimating here the, the you're taking a sample for variance estimate. So the fact that these go down is kind of not terribly surprising. But the other thing that we notice is that add more parallel chains, these curves move to the left. And that means that they're finishing actually in less time. The horizontal axis is one time in hours in the walk scale. So each chain, which is been assigned to compute 10 of the samples is finishing sooner when it's run in an environment where there's lots of other parallel chains. And that means they're starting to share model evaluations. And if I now look at, say, effective sample size per chain per hour, this is with no uh, local approximation, no model approximation. 
And now this was for increasing levels of parallelism. And each diamond is just a different, different one. The thing is random, different, different error, different cost. Um, but this as I walk back here, I'm getting smaller runtime and larger ESS per chain per hour. So this means that the chains are really sharing strength and that each chain is doing fewer model evaluations based on the other model evaluations of other chains. Um, so this is an interesting way for to, to, to spread the expensive part of the computation across uh, multiple chains. How many parameters are in these tests that you're showing? This one um, was six parameters. Yeah, yeah. So these, so yeah, this is a good point. These are in general expensive model, relatively low dimensional parameters. That's, this is this is this is a good one. This is kind of the sweet spot for these methods. Um, well, ten to the fifth samples, samples. Of six dimensional space. Yeah, is a lot different than ten to the fifth samples in a million dimensional. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Yeah. But also uh, approximation. Scales very bad. The, the, the problem of approximation scales very badly with the dimension of the space. And in particular, this is maybe so. This is maybe the, the, the challenge of using local approximation. So that essentially, we're trying to fill the space with model evaluations. So when I construct, when I when I look in a ball around me, I, I want model evaluations all to be sort of relatively near to me. Um, as the dimension gets bigger, that becomes exponentially harder. So this is this is this is good for low dimensional expensive models. Well, maybe good for high, but it's hard to tell. Yeah, I mean, it could be good for high if a bunch of the dimensions are not important. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which gets to dimension well, reduction. Yeah, yeah right. which, I'll, which I'll talk about a little bit later in time. Yeah. We push this um, in other examples, and we've had some stuff maybe 10, 12 dimensions, but that's kind of the right. So, you know, ongoing efforts. Um, you know, one issue is that you know, we're refining the model with some sort of random refinement strategy or various kind of error criterion, but in general you'd like to kind of balance the bias and the variance. You'd like to kind of refine the model approximation uh, at a rate that it doesn't, you don't want to make the model too good too quickly, and you don't want the model to take too long to become good. Uh, and so how to kind of balance these rates um, is something that we're working on. The other thing is that, you know, I focused here on local approximations, and local approximations are nice in that we can show this asymptotic exactness. But what I showed at the beginning, where you say maybe construct a global approximation of this point of the prior, is still not a bad idea. And in some sense, glo global approximations are more powerful. I'm going to say approximate some sort of function using you know, local regression versus kind of global polynomials. I'll have much higher convergence rates if the function is actually smooth if I use a global approximation. So how can I combine global and local approximations in a useful way? Um, how do I do this when my density evaluations are noisy? This happens when the forward model is stochastic. The other variables we're trying to get rid of. Um, these are a lot of ongoing efforts, and I'll put a plug that you should talk to Andy Davis about all these things. And that's what he's working on. Um, okay, so um, I have maybe 15 minutes or a little less than that left, and I want to talk about the other sort of issue, which is sampling. So we talked about various ways of approximating the forward model, but how do you actually draw samples? So up until now, I've just been using MCMC, and MCMC is the workforce algorithm. And there's a zillion bright as MCMC, and there's very interesting things to be done as far as kind of designing efficient MCMC algorithms for all kinds of problems. Um, but what I want to talk about next is something that is not MCMC, and that maybe is kind of complementary to MCMC or an alternative to MCMC. And it's based on the idea of um, coupling probability methods or transporting probability um, between simple distributions that you know how to sample and more complicated distributions that you would like to sample. And this cartoon maybe conveys some of the idea. So suppose my posterior density has these banana-shaped contours here on the right, call it pi. And suppose I have on the left a standard Gaussian, circular density contours. Um, what would be nice to have from the perspective of exploring pi would be a map, say a deterministic function t, that takes samples from eta and transforms them, warps them, so that if I draw a bunch of samples from eta, evaluate the map on those samples, I have samples that are distributed according to pi. <coughs> this would be nice to have. Um, if these are densities in R2, then this is a function from R2 to R2. If these are densities on R something very large, then this is a function from R large to R large. This T is a transport map, and you can say that it deterministically couples these two probability distributions. Equivalently, maybe I want to find the inverse of T. I can think of that as like a map that takes this complicated distribution and Gaussianizes it, warps it so that it looks Gaussian. I want to do this, um, and maybe I want to, if I did this exactly, 
Um, so if I had something, this is my notation here, t pushes forward eta to pi, this means that t transforms eta to pi. Um, if I did this exactly, then actually the problem of sampling would be done. Because I could draw um, iod samples from eta, and I'll have iod samples from pi, just by evaluating that. So that would be amazing. You could do this exactly. In practice, you're not going to do this exactly. You might be content satisfying these conditions kind of approximately, and maybe valuing the error, or using that to precondition other schemes, or there's a rich variety of things one could do. But notionally, this is what we're after. We're after coupling these two distributions in this way. Okay. So how to do this? Um, one thing you might first ask is, you know, does such a map exist? Um, and if so, you know, are there infinity of maps? Um, in general, these maps exist under pretty weak conditions, essentially, that there's no atoms, so there's no delta function, if you will say, in either or five. Because then you couldn't have a deterministic function that takes that probability and smears it arbitrarily over the target distribution. Is there a Bayes' rule such a map? Um, Bayes' rule is... Um, Take the prior and for a Yeah. So you could say that one might be interested in coming, coming up with maps that reproduce Bayes' rule. Mm -hmm. And that's, in some sense, what we're after. But it's not obvious a priori how to construct such a map from Bayes' rule. So, yeah, you could, yeah, for instance, you could imagine, so here I just think of this as a standard Gaussian because it's convenient to sample from. But imagine I take this, transform into the prior, and then have another map that transforms the prior into this figure. And that map can have some this structure. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, I'll show you an example of that. So, what kind of maps are there? So, so we said maps exist under pretty weak conditions, um, but in general there's an infinity of maps. And if you're familiar with optimal transport, uh, optimal transport maps are a particular kind of map that are optimal in the sense of, of all the maps that transform the you know, reference to the target, of all the sort of joint distributions that have these particular marginals, which one minimizes some kind of cost. Um, here we will not be interested in optimal transport. So I'll just mention that optimal maps are one thing you could construct, um, but instead we're actually going to construct maps that have this particular structure um, that are lower triangular. And you can actually, these are limits of a certain kind of optimal transport map. But um, these in statistics will be known as the Rosenblatt transformation and in geometry called the Knoth map. So um, they have the structure where basically these are functions from Rn to Rn. The first component is a function of only one variable, the second is a function of two, although the end is a function of n. And this has a lot of nice features. It, the determinant is a lower triangular matrix, so I can evaluate, sorry, the Jacobian is a lower triangular matrix, so I can evaluate the determinant easily, which I'm going to need to do. The inverse map is also triangular. In a maybe more fundamental way, I'll mention this, it exposes marginals. Uh, like in other words, I can write the first two marginals of the target distribution as a function of only two variables, or the first three as a function of three variables. And you can parameterize these numerically. So we're going to construct numerical approximations of this. These maps need to be monotone in their last variable, so basically T2 needs to be monotone in X2, Tn needs to be monotone in Xn, and you can construct various parameterizations that guarantee that monotone state. Okay. So this is a family of maps that we're going to look for. <laughs> Let's see what problems we can do. Um, um, so we want to construct this family of maps, and now the question is, well, how do I find the map that is good for my problem? And the approach that we're going to take, and as I mentioned, this is not MCMC, this is not important sampling, this is a variational method. We're going to cast the inference problem, the problem of characterizing the posterior, as an optimization problem, where the goal is to say, minimize the KL divergence, which is the measure of distance conclusions, between the push forward of my reference, say my standard Gaussian, under the map T, and the target. And I'm going to search over some space of all of, of maps. And if this is the space of all monotone lower triangular maps, then I know that there's a map that will bring this KL divergence exactly to zero. I know that there's, um, you know, in fact, the unique minimizer of this problem is the Rosen problem. And this is an equivalent problem. But this is actually a problem that I can solve, especially maybe if I write it in this form. This involves an expectation over the reference, which is something that I chose to know how to sample from, like the standard Gaussian. Um, I can discretize that expectation maybe with some samples, with some quadrature rule, and I can solve this minimization problem using pi, using gradients of pi, and so on and so forth. Okay. So let me give you kind of a cartoon of what this thing looks like. Um, this is the reference, this is standard Gaussian. Uh, this is the target. And I just wrote down the target. Is it a Bayesian posterior or not? It's just a target distribution. Now, um, I'm going to show, I'm going to, this is the objective just kind of transformed in some way. And I'm going to optimize over the coefficients of some parameterization of the map. 
and I'm going to show you the current map just by passing samples through the map. The current version of the map, I'm going to take samples from the standard Gaussian, I'm going to evaluate the map on the samples, and those samples are going to be the yellow box. And I'm going to start with the identity map. So these are samples from the standard Gaussian. <laughs> and so now I'm going to turn the crank, I'm going to do some optimization, I'm going to actually just using VFGS, I'm just using a simple cause and Newton method, and this is literally one iteration of VFGS, two, and then three. So effectively, we're taking samples from the target. We've found a transformation that pushes those samples to something close to the reference, or close to the target. Well, what are the basis functions? Yes. Ah, here. So here we used, um, in this monotone parameterization, uh, we put polynomials for AK and BK, and low degree, degree two. And you can also do things like you can replace this exponential with any other positive function. Um, lately, we've been using a square. Um, so, like, b squared plus epsilon. Because then the whole thing is polynomial. Yeah, so, like, how many iterations did you get from the uh, final the, the transport? Um, literally, exactly what you saw. Four. Four. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, this is literally every step of the problem. If we did it in Newton, it actually is like, essentially you know, two steps. Um, so, okay. So, what have we done? We have moved samples to the target distribution. Uh, this is different. We have not reweighed them, so it's not in the sense like important sample. Um, the samples that you get are independent and cheap because you just draw XI from eta and you evaluate the map on it. But now you might say, okay, given the parameterization that I've chosen, how good of a job have I done? You know, what sort of, you know, how, how close am I to actually bringing this KL divergence to zero? Um, what you can actually do is so you can actually evaluate uh, something, you know, for small enough, you can show that this thing, this KL divergence, um, asymptotically, as it goes to zero, is equal to this variance criterion. And this variance criterion is actually more easily computable. You can use this as a convergence criterion. But it has some intuition. So you take the target density, you apply the <coughs> inverse map to it. If you were done, if the map were perfect, then the inverse map applied to the target would look like a Gaussian. So eta divided by the pullback should look like a constant. And insofar as that doesn't look like a constant, then this variance approximates from zero. And so you can use that to evaluate how you're doing. And then you can now you kind of have a computational choice. So suppose I do this for with some map parameterization, and this variance criterion is not quite zero, the KL diverge is not quite zero. I can either stop, I can say that's good enough for me. I can increase the complexity of the map parameterization. Or I can say, well, let me look at the pullback and see how close to Gaussian it is. And in general, the pullback, by having constructed the map, is going to be closer to a Gaussian than what you started with. And you could then apply some other sampling scheme to it. So, I want to say there's kind of a rich set of choices. You can either just use this, view, use this entirely as a variational approach, accept the approximation, refine the, refine the map approximation, or you can essentially compose the map construction with other sampling schemes or maybe another map or some other kind of thing. So there's a lot of choices that one can do. And also I also want to mention, you know, here we're looking at triangular maps, so this is kind of numerically convenient, but um, in the literature, especially in the machine learning literature in the past, you know, three or five years, there's been actually a lot of methods that try to do philosophically similar things. Try to find ways of transporting particles to a target distribution. So beginning with something from a reference and then transporting them to something that looks like a distribution that I care about. Some of these are approximates, some of them are um, kind of a fixed approximations, some of them are in principle exact, but there's sort of a rich variety of things that you might want to do in this area. Now, um, to kind of maybe come back to this notion of computational challenges, is, all of these methods, whether you represent the triangular map, whether you represent something else, run into one bottleneck, which is like, what does the map look like in high dimensions? So if this is a function from Rn to Rn, and now let n be large, now let n be thousands, um, which for me is large, um, how do you make the representation of the map practical? So this is kind of, you know, this was the opening question for um, a couple years of work, uh, mostly from a PhD student, Leslie Spantini. And what we encourage to get into all this, but I'll just basically say that uh, one takeaway from this is a conditional independent structure of the target distribution. So Markov structure. So if you think about the target distribution and you represent its conditional independence properties using a graph, using a Markov random field, something that maybe you're familiar with in spatial statistics, then sparsity of that Markov random field leads to various low dimensional properties of the transformation. And um, I'll kind of skip these and I'll just kind of close with one final property, which is this notion of logic. And this gets back to your question about a map that represents the Bayesian update. 
So um, this is something that actually shows up a lot in those problems, and I'll just kind of walk through a certain example. Of it. Suppose I have an alpha sphere, and I have a likelihood of the choir, and I call that the change mutation to Z. Now, suppose that I have a map that I'm going to call T prior, that takes the reference distribution and pushes it forward to the prior. So this is a simple map, if, for instance, if the prior is Gaussian, and the reference is a standard Gaussian, and this is just some linear map, and I know it, knowing the prior covariance. But in general, the prior is something that I make up, and, or that I impose, and in general, T prior is then something that I can expect. So suppose I do that first. So the first, <coughs> as I walk through my problem, I construct a map that represents the prior. Let me now pull back the posterior by that prior map and look at what's left over. So if I pull back, so I essentially apply the inverse transformation, inverse prior map to the posterior, the density that's left over looks like this. It has basically a standard Gaussian reference here, and then the map has entered into a replica function. Now, this object um, is interesting because this basically reflects um, how much information is there. So insofar as this is different from the standard reference, it basically says how different is the posterior from the prior, and in what directions. And so this can give you some notion of low dimensionality. So here I have the likelihood composed of the prior map, here I have the standard Gaussian, and I can look at the following score function. So this is basically the density of the pullback of the target distribution divided by the prior. Here, this is pi of yz composed of t prior. And if I look at this uh, gradient of the log of this thing r, I'm going to get a matrix, n by n, from an n-dimensional primary space. And if this matrix is low rank, and let's just be simple, let's just say, suppose it is of exactly rank k, then what that means is that there's a rotation that I can find such that the prior departs from the posterior only in k dimensions. In dimensions k plus 1 through n, the prior looks exactly like the posterior. So um, effectively what's that saying is I can find a rotation that takes maybe a prior that has a you know, grid graph, Markov random field, and I pull it back and I create uh, a new distribution that has a bunch of independent standard Gaussians and then some fully connected component. But then I know that I can essentially finish sampling the problem by constructing another transport that departs from the identity only in k dimensions. And why might this oh that must be the part of the file I can't read. Give me a moment. Okay. So um, here, here's an example. So this is a problem from spatial statistics. Um, this is a log Gaussian Cox process. So the idea here is you're trying to infer some latent intensity field. People use these to model things like you know, the, the population of trees in a given area. Uh, maybe the popular number of trees you observe in a given, say, in a unit cell of land is Poisson distributed, and you want to learn the latent, you want to learn the intensity of that Poisson process, and then the intensity in one spatial location is correlated with the intensity in neighboring spatial locations, and you're trying to learn that latent intensity field, which is Z. So law, exponential Z is the intensity. Um, so Z is like the, the, is like the law intensity. So this is, like in general, a non-Gaussian inverse problem. We're using a Markov random field prior, um, so the Markov random field prior has a graph that looks like this, and the only thing I'll comment on this graph is that this is a, a difficult graph from the perspective of inverse. Um, now, if I do what I said, I construct a prior map, I pull back by the prior map, and I look at the rank of this problem, of, of this matrix that's left over, and this problem it turns out to be 30. And that 30 is actually not a coincidence because I observed, it's actually exactly 30, so I'm even numerically 30, because I observed in 30 spatial so even though the problem is notionally very high dimensional, 4,000 dimensional because it's 64 by 64 grid, um, the difference from the prior to the posterior is concentrated in low dimensional subspace. And here's the truth, here's a sample from the posterior, here's the posterior mean, and you can see here's sort of recovering the field. And if you do this, you essentially need to construct a map in 30 dimensions, a pretty low order map in 30 dimensions, which is doable, and you can compare the results with MCMC. So on the top is the mean and the variance that I construct with the transport. And then the bottom is the mean and the variance that I construct with MCMC, and um, they match very, very well. Yeah. Now, underlying this, so I just kind of gave you a particular and simple example. Underlying this is a broader question, and this is what I'll close with, which is, suppose I want to make low-dimensional approximations of the posterior distribution in the following sense. 
I want to take my posterior, which is normally a likelihood times a prior, and I want to replace the likelihood with some function, L tilde. I'm going to do this. And I want to take the parameters and I want to project them essentially onto some R dimensional subspace. So I want to find a projector PR. So within the class of approximations of the posterior that comes from picking an arbitrary function L tilde and a Rankor projector here, what is the best approximation in the sense of KL divergence? Effectively, what we were doing in the previous approximation was using this. It actually found in that case there was no approximation at all because our problem was simple, um, because the observations were local. I can explain why. Um, maybe offline. But in general, now we want to do this in an approximation sense. What is the best such approximation? Does it even exist and can we build it? Um, in general, I don't think this problem is tractable, but what we may be able to do in practice, what we're working on is constructing certified or controlled approximations. So, what you can actually do is derive an upper bound this KL divergence and minimize the upper bound. And that upper bound actually has um, no uncontrolled constancy in that sense of the certified approximation. So what this actually tells you is that um, you can reduce inference problems to a low dimensional subspace and find the best such subspace, so the new subspace, of dimension R and effectively put all the inference machinery onto that subspace and everything else is dominated by the prior. Um, which is characteristic of many inverse problems where um, things are. So with that, um, I'll just conclude, I'll uh, put up a couple things. So basically I just talked about, you know, a glimpse, I think, of two complementary computational challenges in vision inference. One is what do you do about expensive models? Uh, two is what mechanisms do you use for posterior exploration? Uh, I think this, this, um, this uh, transport framework has a lot of flexibility in the sense that you can now treat the sampling problem as an optimization problem, and you can couple this with various sampling schemes. And um, this is something I didn't talk about, but I'll give you some references. There's a lot of uh, interesting results on the low dimensionality of transport maps and how this relates to the structure of the sphere. And a lot of ongoing work on all these things. Um, one thing I'll just mention, if you want to play around with any of this stuff, the local approximation code is in this um, open source software MUC. Um, Andy's one of the main developers on that. The transport map code, uh, we have a Python code that we just put out in the past year. Uh, that lets you do all kinds of constructions of transport maps, and you're very welcome to play that. And then some references. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Yusuf. We have time for one short question. And then, uh, we have time. Who wants to ask a question? It's a little unclear on the uh, conditions or circumstances under which this low dimensional approximation at the end might have. I mean, is it is there some kind of essential redundancy in the in the more complex the original model? Are you you were mentioning, for example, that the rank was the same as the number of samples? Yeah, that that was that was a peculiarity of this example problem. But in general, um, the condition for there being low rank is that the um, likelihood not vary in too many directions relative to the prior. So, what does that mean? so basically, um, here is a goal. Using this notation here, the dimension of the problem essentially comes from looking at um, an integral over the posterior of the outer product of gradients of the log likelihood. So this is a matrix in general. This is a matrix. Now, um, if I have a Gaussian prior, then what you do is you essentially compare, um, this is essentially giving you the directions along which the log likelihood varies. And now we solve a generalized vacuum problem um, that looks like this. I'm essentially comparing how much this, and maybe another way to think about this is kind of like an average Hessian if you will, of the log likelihood, which is saying how informative is the data, and how, how curved is it is the, is the likelihood of this particular thing, and compare its curvature to the prior. This is the, the prior. And this interplay is important because, say, if the prior is very constrained in some direction, then maybe it doesn't matter so much that the data are also informative. So what matters is, are the data informative relative to the prior, which gives you this kind of generalized eigenvalue. And so essentially you then look at the decay of these eigenvalues, and that decay is a notion of the 
intrinsic dimension of the problem. So what kind of physical problem would have that attribute? So, okay, problems with smoothing forward models. So these elliptic PD problems no. have this in space. Because basically you can have lots of variability in the prior. Forward model doesn't give you much, and then so the forward model is effectively flat in um, Problems with few observations. Um, the linear problem will have this, you know, a dimension at most equal to the number of observations. The problem I showed you was nonlinear, but because observations were local, and particularly Marcus structure turned out also to be of the minimum. So basically, if the data are not, if, if there are things that the data do not, do not inform you about, whether because the data are scarce or noisy, or because the forward model smooths things out, that gives you the structure. All right. We time to speak one more time.